Okay, today is Friday, March 31st, 2023, and the time is 1.31. My name is Emma Truscott. I'm a student employee with the RIT Archives, and today I am interviewing Chris Nackis. This is the third interview in the series of interviews. Um, Chris graduated from RIT School of Photographic Arts and Sciences in 1983, and we were working on putting together an exhibition of his work. Um, this interview is being conducted in Chris's house in Rochester, New York. And before we get started, I just want to get your verbal consent to record the interview. Yes, you have my authority to record me and to use my voice and your recordings however you wish. Perfect. <laughs> All right, I'm just going to get started by asking um, how you decided that you wanted to make a documentary about bow hunting and photography. Oh, yeah, it's, uh, it, it, you know, the, the genesis of that thought came, I would say about 1999, 1998. Uh, we were, uh, at, at, that, at that year, I was in the process of producing my first motion picture, Bob Manganelli's uh, screenplay, and, um, during that time, I was just because it's difficult to get financing, and um, I did apply to the MFA program at RIT actually a few years prior to that, and I got into the program. But about maybe a couple months afterwards, my father had a heart attack, so I had to not go to the program, take care of my father, and take care. We had a repair shop at that point. And then I applied afterwards in like 1999 because we were still doing the film and I had an idea, oh, how can I mesh bow hunting and photography together? So I came up with a, with a um, uh, synopsis and I applied to the MFA uh, program again at RIT. I got rejected. But <laughs> the way, what, as I was thinking about shooting a bow and shooting photographs i was you know it, it it came as a development from over a few years and just like any photographer photographers are always looking at things and seeing and framing things in their eyes you don't even have to have a camera but they're always framing things as they're looking at the outside world and when you're shooting a bow and arrow you're doing that also now then I was shooting with a compound bow and not with regular stick bows, uh, old traditional type. But compound bows have two cams, wheels on it, and you pull it back. And I can show you the difference. I have one over there. And you can hold it, and there's a, right, a, a front sight, a rear sight, there's a trigger, and it's a lot more accurate, and, and it feels like you're shooting a gun. And so as I was coming up with some type of you know theory about seeing at that point i read this book it's called golf in the kingdom and um it's uh my friend actually bob told me about that book and it's it's like a spiritual existential book but, but it's not like it's not a horror movie but it's a spiritual thing where this guy is gonna go to scotland to to golf and uh he meets this guy and Anyways, I won't get into that story, but it, it was, and golfers, I think, have the same type of, of look because it's all hand-eye coordination, and it's technique, and it's a swing, and it's the concept of, oh, you have the ball, and you're playing, you're playing the course, and the ball has to go into the hole and everything, and you have, and they become fanatics about hitting the ball just right to get into the hole to get the score as low as possible so i was thinking about that with shooting an arrow even though i suck at golf you know i may play once every 10 years but reading that book gave me that idea and then in 1999 i decided well if i don't get into the mfa program and i'm not able to make this film if we don't get finance I'll see if I can make a documentary shooting by putting those two together. So what I did, and sorry, this is a long way of, of, of explaining this theory. So 
once I started contemplating shooting, the, the way I shoot with the with a camera, it's a Leica. Well, I shoot with different other cameras, but predominantly Leicas. And it's a rangefinder. It's not a single lens reflex. You're not seeing directly through the lens. The lens is offset, and you're looking through a viewfinder. Now, there's a parallax that uh, you know compensates for everything, but you're not when you when you're looking through a a single lens reflex. It's like you're looking through a movie camera because everything is black around, and you see your image, your frame. With the Leica, with the rangefinder, things are a little bit more organic. You put your eye to the rangefinder. But things are still happening all around it, and the rangefinder has a little bit of a square in it, so you're not seeing, you're not ca capturing the whole thing. You're just capturing what's inside that little square that is in the viewfinder. So that over there gave me an idea and saying, okay, now that type of that type of scene is you're getting so many things happening at one time, and you have to pick and choose where your image is going to be and everything is happening around you. You're not just focused in a black box like a single lens reflex. So then I said, okay, if I'm gonna coordinate that with uh, shooting a bow, then I can't use a compound bow where everything is pretty mechanical and you have rear front sight and everything like this. So I decided to go with a primitive bow, long bow and a recurve bow because there aren't any sights. It's you, see your target and after you know practicing practicing from five yards to 10 yards to 15 to 20 yards then your hand and eye are automatically know where the arrow is going to hit so that came a little bit more organic just like shooting with a Leica as opposed to like a single lens reflex so I thought that was a pretty good concept and to shoot an arrow just for it's just like uh you did you ever play basketball or did you ever throw football or everything all right let's say basketball now if you're around five feet away from the hoop you know pretty much the trajectory that you have to you know throw the ball it's going to go up like now if you 10 feet back you know you have to compensate for that if you go 20 feet back you have to compensate a little bit more just like throwing a football or a baseball if you're five feet away you know how to throw that ball. If you're 10 feet away, you know how to, 20 feet, and the arch gets bigger as, you're, as your target gets farther away. The same thing with an arrow without any sights. Once you practice enough, it's like shooting a ball. When you're five feet away, you're looking at your target, concentrating on it, and your hand automatically knows where to point towards your target, your, your bow hand. And you release the arrow if you're 10 feet away or 10 yards away your hand automatically compensates and as you go farther or closer in your hand will compensate with your eye so once obviously you practice enough then you'll be able to hit your target but there was a problem with that <laughs> when you use a compound or, or not a comp i'm sorry a uh, a recurve or a long bow, a primitive bow, once you draw, that arrow has to be as close, the back of the arrow, to your eye as possible as you're looking at your target and your bow. Now, I'm right-handed, but I'm left-eye dominant. Usually, if you're right-handed, you're right-eye dominant. If you're left-handed, you're left-eye dominant. So, but I'm right-handed, but I'm left-eye dominant. So as I'm drawing my bow, you know, I'm not using my dominant eye because I'm shooting right-handed, so I can never hit the target that well. So I sucked at it really badly. So, so now what I had to do, if I was going to pursue this, I said, well, what I have to do is change, because if I want my arrow to come to my eye, I have to change. I have to start shooting left-handed instead of right-handed. So that's right. You know, with a compound bow, it's easy. If all you do, you draw it right handed and you close your left eye, and then you just look through the rear sight and the front sight, and you can shoot your bow. But with this type of shooting, you can't. You want to shoot with your, with your dominant eye. And I photograph with my left eye. 
instead of shooting with my, I always shoot with my left eye. So that's why I'm, so I'm dominant. My, my dominant eye is my left eye in photographing and in shooting. So what I did, and I came up with a concept of, all right, what I will do is train myself to start shooting left-handed on my bow. And that's why I started with my documentary too. And actually the whole documentary was the beginning of bow hunting season all the way to the end of bow hunting season. So in the beginning of the season, which is your pre season of preparation of shooting of, 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 of getting ready, understanding where you're going to go into the woods and everything like that. So it was one whole documentary. It was like, uh, what, what do they call it? Uh, cinema ver veritas uh ver verite and it's a french word verite, cinema verite. and so what i was so i started and the whole film is like that it's in the spring i think it's 2014 all the way till the end of both into january 2015 and I just pieced everything together. So all the hunting aspect was exactly what had happened hunting. I didn't, you know, cover anything up, whether it's a miss or whether it's a kill, whatever it was. And the photography was during those seasons also what I was doing. And so, um, so my whole theory was, all right, if I can shoot an arrow and get good at shooting, or hitting my target and not only hitting the target bow hunting with it because the difference there's a big difference between just shooting the target and shooting a live animal you have you don't you don't want to miss you don't want to have a bad shot missing the deer is fine you know you just you know wounds your your ego which who cares about that a wounding a deer is a terrible thing you don't want to wound a deer so you want to make sure you have a clean kill and um, so there's no suffering of, of the animal and uh, obviously you want a clean ethical kill each time. So you must practice and the better that you get at it, obviously you'll become a better bow hunter. So I was thinking, so if I start using that technique, which makes you concentrate even harder on your target on your motion, the the technique that you're using for shooting a bow at an animal, well, that should translate over as when you're shooting something in a in your camera, you take that extra second or split second when to frame, when not to frame, when to shoot the when to hit the shutter, when not to hit the shutter, and you know with with digital, you know I don't want to. <laughs> you know, I don't want to be this, oh, I'm such a purist, where I'm not. But digital, you can, or with an automatic, you know, what is it, an autofocus, an auto that, you know, you can shoot and you have a lot of images that you can pick and choose from and everything. Then it becomes more of a bing, 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 you're just plucking away a thing instead of really seeing and trying to capture that image by hand and eye coordination that has been mastered so to speak so it so you know when to focus and when to shoot not even using hyperfocal distance a lot of times i use that but when to focus on an object really quickly that you want to shoot and click to the shutter that doesn't always happen obviously you can still waste film but it's not as mindless as ching ching just shooting or shooting and shooting and shooting so the, so that was what i was trying to portray in the film now there's a lot more to it that uh you can't put everything in a, in a movie and i would my 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 goal after making that film was to make a book actually and write the theory out that i'm talking about and and then have photographs obviously put my photographs into the book and uh and 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 that's it and hopefully now i'm i'm an old man now so hopefully i and the whole goal is like obviously for bow hunting is to to kill your animal 
which is because you're you're going to eat it actually and if it's a mature whitetail uh, buck you have your trophy head and with your camera you're always trying to get that masterpiece photograph not everything's going to be a masterpiece but to you personally to you what you would think is a masterpiece photograph and i think i have a few of them that i consider for myself i mean people may not think it but for me personally i this is the photograph that i would say okay now everything fell into place and i can be happy with this photograph just like all right i'm after this particular white tail buck and if i'm able to kill that buck then i've mastered that everything came into place i did my homework in the woods i picked out my ambush spot the time was right and i was able to shoot it now uh, henry cartier bresson we're talking about his way of photography is called the decisive moment the decisive moment is when everything falls into the frame and it doesn't have to be people it can be anything but the composition makes itself as you because there, there are infinite possibilities as you're walking outside doing anything anywhere objects come together you come together your eye looks at things and it frames it and then the moment that you shoot the shutter and you get that shot that becomes the quote the decisive moment of the photograph uh that is uh that, that you want to show with bow hunting or any type of hunting it's called the moment of truth which because once you let that arrow go you can't bring it back and the moment of truth is when you see your object when you're going to shoot it you draw back and you shoot it once it's gone it's gone you can't bring it back and uh you know i i coined i think inside that film also you know in photography well in, in bow hunting um you you kill life in photography you capture life so it's like a yin and yang type of thing in that also so that is the connection that i was trying to make with my specific type of photography and my specific type of bow hunting which doesn't mean that other type of photography is not valid and which doesn't mean by hunting with other methods is not valid either that's just my personal way of seeing things right. and that's how i came up with this uh a long-winded way of <laughs> telling you how i came up with this with this concept no, thank you but i'm going to pause this real quick sure because i realize Okay, we're resuming the interview with Chris Nakis on March 31st. Okay. Um, I guess then, like, how did you, how did you feel when you saw the product, uh, the final product of the movie? Of the movie? It was, uh, you know, it, it was, it was a small documentary. I think it, it, it was about $20,000, which, I mean, that's not for filmmaking purposes it's not a lot of money and i wanted to make sure that i paid everybody that worked on it when we made our first film we did pay everybody and they were interns also they didn't get paid so this time and they want and they were perfectly happy to be interns because they were on they were on set and they were in the production office and they learned a lot about making a film but for the documentary i wanted to use everybody um as much as i could from the people that had a dog town and so i would use uh kids that were helping as pas and i would pay them you know every day for helping out and uh so as a small independent film it's all right it's okay i mean it's not great production value but it's not bad and we didn't have um you know let's say the three deer that i killed in there were giant deer like i have over here then i'd be known in the bow hunt I, you know it would go to i'd be able to sell this film on uh you know the outdoor channel or something like that and people would know me like, oh man you know the guy from from Rochester, the bow hunter, and he's like a photographer, but look at these big deer that we got because that's what sells on those programs. 
unfortunately, uh, the big deer that I was after, the poison ivy buck, I didn't get it on film, but I got the next year. So I edited that in in the end of the film. But the film could have been better in the sense that, once again, my partner in filmmaking, Bob Manganelli, I asked him, all right, you're not a bow hunter, but you're a photographer. So why don't we make this documentary? You come over here, you learn about bow hunting, and let's see how you shoot, because your photographer will follow you photographing also. And then we can have pictures and the interaction between he and I, which would be pretty good, because we destroy each other really well. And it, it would it would have had a <laughs> it would have had a good narration over there. And then we would have seen him as not being a bow hunter, but a photographer, and using the concept of seeing in photography, now transferring that over into shooting a bow, whether he would have had a kill or not, or a miss or whatever, or whether he would have been able to do anything. And then we would have gone back and forth, and actually he would have put money into it, and then we would have had a bigger film. A bigger narration, a bigger thing, so it may have been a, it may have been a better film, but unfortunately, that he didn't really want to do it, and his son died that year also, and so he wasn't in a position mentally to do anything. But for for what the film is, I think it's okay for uh, for just a you know small little independent film with. I mean, the the editor worked at Dogtown also. He was in high school and he learned how to edit film and he was a pretty sharp kid so I wanted to give him the opportunity to to edit the film and uh, it was it's all right it's not bad it's not bad for a, for a small little documentary on a concept or well telling when people would ask me what, what's your concept what's this film about I would tell them you know it's you know it's the merger of bow hunting and fine art photography and they would you know <laughs> it's not gonna work but when I had a premiere at the cinema, I invited everybody and we, we showed the film at the cinema and people got it and they understood the concept and uh, there's a story and the story was told and people understood the story. So I guess that's okay. Yeah, so. that, I feel like that makes a successful documentary. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you mentioned a book before, like would you ever want to pursue that? Oh yeah, that's uh, that's what I'm hoping to do, and uh, that's why I have all these other little projects in mind that I'm going to photograph and uh, put, you know, my newest work in there. Also, I haven't I haven't photographed for about a year now, and so I have to pick up and start photographing again. And but I still have a lot of other photographs that I that that I haven't uh, put on my uh, on my blog that I still have to, you know, digitize somehow and, and, and begin again. And I want to um, continue on and have a continuation of it. And once the book is, you know, I'd like to put as many photographs in the book as possible to make it more a photographic book. And then obviously put the bow hunting aspect in it. Um, and the photographs of deer kills, I want to juxtapose those inside too because it's for bow hunters also. So I don't want to, uh, you know, whoever is going to be offended with it. And I, I don't see why anybody should be offended with it. But I want to put both aspects of this um, exercise in there, having the photography and the bow hunting. And that's why when I, every time that I shoot a deer, I have my friends photograph me. Now most of them, uh, all right, I, I kill mostly does because I let the smaller bucks go. I let them get to at least four and a half, five and a half years of age. So their antlers are bigger. And the does are why I kill them because we have so many over here. And the DEC, the Department of Environmental Conservation, as bow hunters in this area, Section 8C, they want us to kill as many does as possible to keep the population down because there's too many car deer accidents. They're destroying the, uh, 
you know, the vegetation, the, the petunias and everything from, uh, from the neighbors. And if there are too many deer, like there were in the Rondacoit, you get disease, starvation, and that's never good for a, a deer herd. So I try to, and the venison is delicious, so as many dough as possible, I fill up my freezer. And um, so I do have those pictures where, where I would put on there. But the big trophies, like they say, the big antler deer, uh, I've got two of them. And um, I always let the other ones, the smaller ones go. So if I get another couple of those, I will have those inside the book also. But that, hopefully within the next five years, I'll have that all set and done. And whether it makes money or not, it probably won't. But I'll still put as much money into it too. So it's a, so it's a well-crafted book and not like junky, you know, reproductions of photographs. So, and hopefully by that time, um, my concept will have you know, developed even further. So we shall see. Awesome. Okay, now I'm like kind of jump into something else, mm -hmm. but it relates to, I guess, just your photographer process. I remember you mentioned a few times back the blue horses. I forget exactly what artist it was. Franz Mark. Franz Mark. That's right. Mm -hmm. And um, how you like felt like you you knew you would always do photography from then then on. Can you tell mm -hmm. me a little bit more about that story? Okay. Well, the story. Um, I'll go from the beginning. So, yeah. So obviously I'll regurgitate it, and you can cut out whatever you need and everything. So it was in Austria. My third year at RIT, we we uh, went to Austria, Salzburg, Austria, and Salzburg was was the college that we studied for and everything transferred over to RIT. So we decided to stay the whole year instead of half a year. Some kids stayed half a year. We decided to stay a whole year and the director of the college, Dr. Ina Stegen, she was also the art history instructor. Great. We drove her crazy. We drove her crazy. We probably the, uh, too many stories of, but we did pretty well in her class so, and, um, she was a great instructor, so she took us all the way from like primitive art all the way to, you know, modern art of, by that time in the 80s. And so, and it was, it was really, it was really enlightening. And, you know, going through the development of art, all the different movements, like, you know, Jackson Pollock is my favorite painter. So when I was a kid, I hated it. I said, what is this thing? We used to play this game, it was called Masterpiece. And then you had the, you would bid on these paintings and everything, and you would see a, you know, lavender mist. I remember the painting, like, what the heck is all scribbles? But then when you understand the concept of it and the progression of it and abstract expressionism, now he's my favorite artist. I didn't realize that until that class. But prior to Jackson Pollock, there was the, German, the, the Expressionist period and Franz Marc, and that was in the early 1900s. And Franz Marc was an up-and-coming Expressionist painter. And um, unfortunately, in World War I, he was drafted and he died in the Battle of Verdun. And uh, I remember Dr. Stegen narrating that, uh, that piece and um, his life and with the blue horses and at that point it's just something that just triggered my mind and just made me think about it and I said aha uh -huh. here was this guy that was going to be you know very influential as an artist going forward and all of a sudden I mean, he dies in World War One, and everything stops so and that could happen no matter what, whether you go to war, whether you have cancer, whether you get hit by a car, you fall off a bike, whatever the heck happened, you stop. So my mind was, I never knew when I was going to die. So no matter what was going to happen, I had to keep shooting. Because I knew these type of photographs that I'm trying to master, you're not gonna make a lot of money out of them. I'm not gonna be a wedding photographer. I'm not gonna be a studio photographer. I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to master the black and white full frame so I knew I just had to keep shooting no matter what and uh, until I die just keep shooting and producing work because I didn't want to be like Franz Marc that boom 
just died right in the you know right in the beginning when he's about to to create his best work. So whether I was going to die for whatever, but I just said don't stop, just keep going, just keep going because you never know what can happen. And that was the genesis of the and the blue white tail is that the blue horses. Now I'm you know 62, so when I did the blue white tail, what was that? I was 50 something. And so I made it that far. I made it farther than Franz Mark. So that is like my homage to Franz Mark. I'm here, so this blue white tail is my uh, progression, so to speak. And I, as I promised myself, I wouldn't stop. And um, as a matter of fact, I had uh, our colleague, she was an artist, graduated in 1983 with us. She was in my first freshman class, she's really good, and I had her uh, make the, uh, the logo for me, the, uh, both those logos. So Jeannie Arnold is her name, and she's a good artist. Awesome. Cool. All right. Um, then from there, can you just tell me a little bit about um, your process as a photographer and, like, why 35 millimeter, like why full frame? I guess you've kind of incorporated it in other things, but. Yeah, the full frame, well, I didn't know about full frame photography. Uh, I, you know, all I knew was, co well, in high school, Russian, uh, in high school, I had, I was all, I was in all the egghead classes, the honors and AP and all that stuff. And so I wanted to, have a little break in the winter season because wrestling is really hard and you have to cut weight and everything. As a photographer, it would be an easy thing to, to jump into to get to have an easy course. So I jumped into that and I told you the story before, but the teacher was an industri the industrial arts teacher. So he really didn't know that much about it. He knew you gotta have contrast and you know you got leading lines and you got this and that. So he gave us a little basic type of stuff. And that's what I started shooting. And, um, you know, you, you have your enlarger and you have your negative in, you start, you know, lifting your enlarger up and you're cropping the picture to get whatever you like. Oh, okay, this looks good. So you would crop and it's just normal photography. And I didn't know anything about anything, just what I had learned in high school. And then I took some classes at RIT as a senior. It was a dollar a class that you can take as a senior. So, and the night school guys that were the instructors there, they weren't anything, they were the same type of thing. Um, a little bit more advanced, but yeah, you just photograph and you're cropping, you're doing all this stuff. And it was just the same normal photography. They loved my photographs of my tigers that I went to the zoo and I took these portraits of these tigers, but I was able to, uh, you know, crop the picture. Oh, wow, this way. And so, all right. And then finally in freshman class with our, uh, Michael Solori, he started showing us all these things with full frame photography. And he gave us all a cardboard cutout. Because when you put your negative into the negative carrier, a 35 millimeter carrier, it will automatically crop everything out. You don't get a full frame. You don't get that black board around it. So he gave us all cardboard holders that we can put into the two and a quarter carrier and you have a full frame uh, image there. And you knew that because you had a black border. So he always told us, crop in the viewfinder, not in the enlarger, not in the dark room. So that forced us. And the other guys in my class, they were way far more advanced in this because they took uh, you know, better photography courses before they came there. And I would look at him and say, wow, how are you shooting like that? I can't believe it. I remember Dave Seal, he would always laugh. I'd go, how did you do that over there? And then I saw the photograph of, it's called As. It's Henry Cartier's Brousseau. There's a staircase with a railing also and a bicyclist going out of the frame. I went, wow, okay, this is what I have to try to learn how to do. And from then on, it was, well, let me try to master that full frame and it's got to be black and white I, I don't care about color for anything you have to master the black and white now Brousseau he's a junkie printer he couldn't print well so 
not only did I want to master shooting, but I wanted to master black and white printing. And uh, Eugene Smith, who was my other paper photographer, W. Eugene Smith, he was a master printer. And so printing inside, you know, there's so many tricks in the dark. And so I wanted to make sure that I, would, I could shoot those photographs and print them with, um, with the chemicals. And so, uh, you know, obviously going through Owen Butler's class, who he taught us his own system and printing, and he was tough. You know, if you look at your photo, you're like, what's his jump? And you throw it. Uh, and you, and you, it was like a drill sergeant, and you were afraid to have junky stuff in front of him. So that upped their game, and uh, that's, that's where I was. I knew that this is the type of photography that I was that, that I want to, and I'm still a poor photographer because I hardly sell anything. <laughs> so after how many years? Oh, it's 40 years now, 83 to 2023, I'd like that. And I put a lot of money into it. Hardly any money came to me from it, so I'm in the negative. <laughs> That's how it goes for us. <laughs> um, what are some things that you value the most about photography? Oh, the, the, the main thing is once you get that image that you know, okay, this is, this is, this is it, this is, this is the trophy. This is your trophy picture. You, when, I mean, you get pictures, you, okay, this is all right, and you can put things up on your, but when you get that image, you go, ah, that's it. That is the most fulfilling thing. And it, it's great uh, when you have it in the, dark room and you're processing it and it's because it's not just a picture it's printing it and dodging and burning and making it perfect and, and then making the selenium taking out the silver and replacing it with selenium and making that and then you have that and you're looking at it and it's there and you're going all right yeah this is a good shot this is something that is preserved perfectly and this is what you wanted that is the best part of photography when you have that picture when you know a lot of times you know it when you shoot it and you go yes this is going to be it you can't wait to, to process that film then you process it yeah that's it and then you print that up and that is the shot that you like that you want that's your quote masterpiece that you've taken that's the best part of photography and would you say that you do just as much work in the dark room processing as you do when you're out shooting? Oh, more in the more? dark room. Shooting is the fun part because you're outside. I mean, sometimes you can get in heck, you know, people get mad at you and get into fights and arguments sometimes because they don't know. You're in a public square. You can get photographed any time by anybody. So, ah, you get it. Ah, oh, shut up. And so you get into arguments a lot of times, but what, what can you do? So sometimes... And you know sometimes you get tired out there, but in the dark in the dark room, there's no place where time flies faster than when you're in the dark room. That's why you know when we're trying to get in the dark room, there's only what <laughs> four hour shifts and everything. <laughs> so you get inside there. And, all right, you just started. Ah, I'm not done. But you got to clean up and everything like this and that. And you had a whole line. Now how are you going to get out and go back to the back of the line so you can get another four hours? Oh, it was terrible. But in the dark room, time will fly, will fly so fast you wouldn't believe how fast it flies in the dark room. And um, yeah, that is, it's a lot harder in the dark room working on it. Now, I don't have that much, uh, well, digitally, because now for the blog that I was doing, I would take the photo of the, uh, the negative and I would digitize it and then I put it into Photoshop. I'm not doing it right because you're supposed to section things off and do that. You don't know how to do that. But there's a dodging tool and a burning in tool. <laughs> so I'm destroying the image, I guess. But I'm just playing with it as if I'm in the dark room and I'm dodging here and burning there. Make a little contrast here. Blue, lightening up and everything. So it's just like me in the dark room. And that's, I mean, it's easier because it's in the screen. You're in white light you're not in a dark room and um but i ha i i haven't really printed that much i i just printed so i could put it on the blog but i've only printed 
a couple images where I took the uh, the manipulated image and put it into a printer or a, a computer with a I don't know, the printer with photographic paper, digital paper, uh, dyes. They're all dyes now, and I only did a couple of those. So um, I don't know. I mean, that's that's easier. It looks a lot easier, so I'll have to try that sometime. Hopefully, I can get a big old printer and, and do that sometime. Yeah, yeah, that would be nice. Are you doing? So, are you doing mostly? Or how do I want to ask this? Are you going into any dark rooms lately and processing? Uh, no dark room. I had I built a beautiful dark room in my house. Oh, it was giant, two giant stainless steel sinks, and everything. had the, the Omega larger. The four by five, just like we had at RIT, Schneider lenses. I had light table, but I had to sell the house, so I gave all my equipment to another filmmaker here. He has a dark room, and he, I give him my, when I'm shooting, he processes my film for me. So, but I gave, and he has a um, he has a dark room, which eventually I hope to use because I have another project in mind that I want to do before I die, also that I thought of when I was in college after I learned about Jackson Pollock. I think I told you about that. And so, um, as a matter of fact, I came back from Utah, and that's the topography, the, the, the Moab Desert. That is what I will use for my next project that is going away from full frame photography, but not really, but I will have to process it with, uh, with the chemicals, that thing with the brushes and everything. That. So I will use that when I get a chance to do that. Then I'll use the dark rooms again. Awesome. I'm just gonna check where we're at time-wise. Okay, perfect. We're good. We're okay, I think. Um, so, what we what would you say up until now is like your biggest success in your career? In in photography. Mm -hmm. um, I would say, uh, whew, well, it's. I, I kind of think that I had made some pretty good photographs. I really haven't had big exhibits or anything like that. I had, um, I had one at the U of R. As a matter of fact, I just, I just remembered that that uh, they needed, uh, they wanted somebody to put some photographs up there. So I put a bunch of photographs up there and uh, got a lot of really good accolades from the people writing on the book. Um, so it's not really a, I mean, there's, everything that I've shot is just for me because everything goes into the, uh, the portfolio boxes and it's, there are not really that many accolades, just that exhibit where everybody kind of liked the photographs and uh, I'll actually, yeah, when I came back from Greece, I took a class at RIT again, just a two-credit class, just so I could get in the dark rooms. And the instructor is the one that I knew. He used to run the, the cage. His name was Dwayne, so he knew all I had to do, just go in. He knew I was working. I didn't have to give him his photographs to look at him because he was teaching the night class. But he said, just make sure you come to the final, you know, critique. All right. So I came in and I'm, sh and I'm making 16 by 20 prints, archival prints with selenium film. So I think I brought maybe 20 of them. And uh, I was the first one there, so I just put them on the, around the room, like that, you know, on the desks and everything. Then everyone came up in there, put their photographs up and everything. And they all started laughing because they thought Dwayne had come in and gotten some, like, master photographer to put his pictures up over there and they were laughing okay they're like who where'd you get these photographs from <laughs> they're how mine they're his over there so they gave me a, an ovation and i guess that is an accolade <laughs> i can go i mean it doesn't really mean anything because guaranteed everyone that was in that class they forgot about that <laughs> so they don't know that was how many years ago that was in the 80s so uh, Still, that's a that's, nice moment. That's, yeah. That's the only thing. So, the only accolade I have, I, when I get something, I just put it in the box and put it away. 
That's about it. <laughs> okay. And um, what kind of things are you shooting now, nowadays? Oh, like I said, I haven't shot in a year, but it doesn't matter. I just, wherever I go, um, like just walking up in the store, I will photograph things. When I see things around here, I'll just come up and shoot. It doesn't matter where. I will just shoot. I didn't go to, I didn't shoot in Utah, but I just, where I just came back from there, I just wanted to look at it first. Plus, I wanted to ski. So I didn't want to take the time to, to shoot and at the desert, but just to see whether I will ever come back and shoot that. But for me, it's just wherever. Um, I get dropped. A lot of times I would just get dropped off like into the city and I'll just walk home and just walk from there and photograph and uh, you know, go to uh, Watkins Glen or anything down south and wherever I'm going to go, festivals like uh, uh, Park Avenue Festival or, or Greek, but I've done the, a bunch of those again. Uh, I had a, a, I wanted to do a bunch of portraits. I like to do portraits of people in available light without, you know, lights and everything like that. So. I had a whole group that I wanted to photograph from, from Dogtown, but I'm not going to do that now. I have to find other people to, uh, to shoot. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Um, and where do you see the rest of your photography career going from now on? Uh, well, that's a good question. Um, all I, the only thing I think will happen is I will continue to sh I will continue shooting and hopefully I'll be able to get the equipment where I can print my photographs digitally because to go into the dark room is just a lot more expensive and I don't have my setup with me I have to go to somebody else's dark room and that's so if I can do that then I will make some another exhibit but the focus is trying to make a book and put as many images that I can in a book with my bow hunting photography theory and that will be the, uh, the, the culmination the climax of my photographic quest I guess at that point so um, and you never know and, and with that book I would like to have a uh, photographic opening because it's always good to see the actual image behind a frame that you see in a book and uh, and some other things that go along with it that, that aren't in a book and so I would always try to do that and uh, but you know those are you know to get exhibits I would just have to go around to, to see where I can exhibit there are not that many places to exhibit but if I can make a book and then put some exhibitions on, I, uh, I'd be happy. I have to obviously pay for it myself and, uh, and go from there. Great. Awesome. That's the end of my questions, um, unless you have anything else to add. No. Cool. Yeah. All right. It. Thank you. Mm -hmm.